discuss and exchange thoughts about Islam and how it functions in the United States, Islam and pluralism. I'll keep the introduction short because we have many topics to cover. The program is three segments. First segment is about Islam and pluralism. And the second segment is how do we create an open community while following religion. The third segment is why are religious people not confident about their own faith? Each segment is roughly one hour or 45 minutes. In the first 20 minutes, each one of us will give a presentation and followed by in five or 10 minutes, commentary from Imam Sahab and Adam Rashid. And then for the next 20 minutes, will be open question and answers. All questions are open and you can ask any question. And I hope this discussion becomes meaningful to those who are watching us on the video and we're not giving any answers. It's a discussion that we want you to carry forward and learn and share with us. Together we all can discuss and learn a lot more. Thank you very much. Now we're going to go with the big, brief introductions. Imam Sahab. My name is Zia Ul Haq Sheikh and uh, I'm the Imam at the Islamic Center of Irving, uh, a suburb of Dallas, Texas. I've been in the United States since the end of 1995. I originate from uh, the Pakistani side of Kashmir. I was born there. I was raised in England, and uh, I stayed there, did all my studies there, uh, until I finally came to the US in 1995, I, where I have been since. And uh, uh, I have a wife and two kids. Let me add to that. Uh, he is one of the most respected imams for me personally. There are very few Imams who truly understand Islam in its entirety. And he understands when Prophet Muhammad operated in a society where Jews, Christians, and everyone lived together. And whatever he said was sensitive and respectful and uh, pluralistic. And Imam Zia is one of the few Imams that I know who understands that very well and he has been involved in many interfaith dialogues in Dallas non-stop and he has been part of many of the events and I salute you Imam for being the true Imam for us here in Dallas. Assalamu alaikum, my name is uh, Mona Fazil Shah. I am a physician by training and a journalist by practice. I am a full-time journalist and activist out of Dallas area and uh, my focus is uh, terrorism and counter-terrorism, minority rights in Pakistan. I'm also um, an op-ed fellow, uh, 2014, and uh, I am working on two documentary films on gender rights and drone um, attacks in Pakistan. Um, I'm a mother of uh, twin girls, and I um, live in Dallas. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my name is Mawsam Sayed. Uh, I came to this country in 1975, basically um, a professional engineer at a nuclear power plant. I've been involved with mosques and various uh, political or activism related issues since 1985. And here again, I'm a volunteer to whatever cause may arise for Muslim community. My name is Dr. Amir Suleiman. I'm an electrophysiologist, meaning I'm a cardiologist who specializes in rhythms of the heart. I also have a bachelor's in journalism and history, and I just like academic discussions uh, regarding Islam and uh, a little bit opinionated, as you will notice. Assalamualaikum. My name is Sana Anwar. I went to UT Austin for my undergraduate degree in Middle Eastern Studies and Communications, and right now I'm getting my master's in Global Comm in DC. Um, I'm super proud of being a Muslim American of Pakistani descent, and I hope, inshallah, to be able to represent all three identities in whatever career path I choose. Good evening, and assalamu alaikum. I'm uh, Dr. Khwaja Noman Anwar, originally from Pakistan. I've been in the United States since 1976 and a citizen since 1981. I'm a physician, 
uh, I practice in uh, Artesia, New Mexico at this time. And I try to uh, be active in various uh, Muslim and Islamic issues, uh, as well as uh, issues of common interest at large. Thank you. Hello, my name is Adam Rashid. I'm, um, my background is mostly in religious studies, uh, as, long, as well as Islamic sciences. Um, uh, born and raised here in the United States, but spent some, a lot of time overseas as well. Um, my focus is primarily around the Quran, uh, studying it, um, uh, and discussing it within the context that we live in, um, within, of course, our, our current modern time. I'm based in Chicago, um, but I'm here uh, for a visit, and Mike was kind enough to invite me to this discussion. My name is Mike Gauss. Uh, I must say, I was a Muslim, born, raised Muslim, then went out of the fold, then became Muslim again. And I'm very proud of being a Muslim. And my focus is pluralism in Islam. I see Islam as a pluralistic deen, and uh, that is all inclusive. In a few words, when we start with the Rabbul Alameen, with Allah, and Rahmatul Alameen, I would say, Makhlukul Alameen, we belong to the whole nations, whole communities, and that has been my focus. And I have done a few, I have taken up many challenges in the last few years. One of them was Pastor Roberts here in Dallas, and he challenged Quran, and we did a Quran conference with 10 pastors, clergy from different faiths, including Imam Zia Sheikh. And uh, then I took up with the Quran burning incident, inshallah, we're making a film about that in Florida. Then we had uh, conferences on Shia, sorry, Sharia and others, and also have held uh, two conferences, intra-faith, that is within the faith, a Shia Sunni, once we did at the Rice University, and inshallah we'll be doing one at the Harvard University. And the Qatar Foundation has also invited to do a talk on uh, bridging the gap between Shia and Sunni. And Alhamdulillah, the university in Qom has invited me to go study a two weeks intensive course on Shia theology. I hope to learn that as well. And I'm self-taught. I believe uh, people always ask, what is your qualification? My qualification is what Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said. Every Muslim has a responsibility to read and learn Quran and see its value and propagate their true values. And that's what I am. Thank you very much, and now we'll begin the program. The first part of the program is pluralism in Islam. And let me stand up and talk about that. It makes it easy for me. I believe Islam is pluralism. Let me define what pluralism is first. Pluralism is respecting the otherness of others. You are who you are, I am who I am. God has created me to be as unique as you are, and learning to respect and accept that is essentially pluralism. I will quote a few references from Quran and few practices of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to support what I'm talking about. In Quran Surah Hujura 49:13. It, it essentially says, I'll give the outline, and I'll speak as if my fellow Americans and others can understand, not in the Quranic language, a third person, but I'll speak as if God would have said it. God says, I have created you all into many nations, tribes, and communities. And then he says, from one single couple. That means the entire world is one family, large family. When he created each one, he created as unique. He does say in Quran that if I wanted, I could have created all of you alike. But he chose to give us individual identity. And, uh, and I think it may be necessary because if there is a crime watch, I was talking to the police chief, Dallas police chief, and he liked the idea that God has created unique for us. And on the day of judgment, maybe that's how God identifies us. Each one has a different thumbprint, eye print, our DNA is different, each one is unique. Even if you were raised in the same family, you, two children or two siblings, have different taste buds 
for clothes or food, salt, sugar. So that's how unique we are created and that's God's choice for us to be unique. And when he created the universe, two major things came out of it. One was the matter and the other one was life. Matter was programmed, everything, whether you look at the planet, stars, moon, everything is programmed to function precisely. In Surah Rahman, when we talk about An-Najmu wa Shajru as Judan, and these are not sajda in means obedience in a larger context. In this context, all of them are doing their sajda, doing exactly what they were programmed to do. When God created human beings, we were not programmed to function like the stars, moons, seasons. We were given a complete free will. It's up to us to create that balance. God tells, look at all this planetary system. Everything is in balance, functions in balance. Now you humans figure out how to live in balance. Each one of you is different. So given that, then when he created life, you got matter of life. In life there are two versions, broad versions. One is animal version and the other is human version. In the animal version, God said, when I created so many nations, so many tribes, so many species, there is bound to be conflicts for resources. When there is conflict, how do you settle the conflict? God gave the animals horns, fangs, paws, and that's how they settle. But when it came to human life, God said, I'm not going to give you that. I'm going to give you a tongue so you can dialogue and ta talk and resolve your issues. And I see that message coming from Quran clearly. The free will, human nature. And uh, when, there, when there are conflicts, conflicts originate from three key sources. One is space, your space, spiritual space, physical space, home, whatever you want to call it. Second part is sustenance, that is food for survival, food and water. Third part is nurturance, your loved ones. These three are critical for any human to survive. And anybody messes with these three creates conflict. And how do we resolve the conflict? It is through dialogue, through resolutions. And God again says that we, he, was, he created as human as Khalifa, means somebody who can manage the affairs around us. In animals, they cannot manage other than their own body. Humans, we can manage our environment, we can change the air conditioning, we can fly, we can do all these things, and still we are not used full brain power. Now, given this creation and diversity, there's conflicts, and God comes back in 49, 13 again, he says, he knows, God knows, Islam is about human nature. And God says, that you're going to have conflicts and you have to figure out how to leave that conflict. And then he says the best ones among you are the ones who take time to know each other. When we take time to know each other, conflicts fade and solutions emerge. And uh, the, the work that Imam Sahib is doing, all of us are doing, doing the interfaith dialogue. We are dismantling some of the myths about Muslims. And we also have myths about Christians and Jews that we need to dismantle. And that comes from following the Quran's wisdom from 49, 13. Learn about each other. When we learn about each other, a majority of the conflicts will go away. And I'm going to tag that. With how, with the word Amin. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The first foundation I call it of Islam is being a meal. Even before he preached about Islam, he talked about he became the Amin. That is, he was trustworthy, people feel safe around him, he told the truth, and he was a just man. And that was not by Muslims. It was who he lived amidst, that is Jews, Christians, and pagans and others. And he earned that. And that's how you build a society. If you were to hire Mr. Spock today, come down and create a world where there are less conflict, people can live cohesively, he would look things differently. 
He is not conditioned to see things from a religious point of view. He is conditioned to see objectively. You read a book, you get the wisdom and you act. And he sees that and he collapses all these religions into the idea that religion is a system to bring peace to an individual, remove the fears, bring some solace and create a cohesive society where nobody has to live in fear. And Islam, from my point of view, fits very well. And three examples of Prophet Muhammad, I want to share that. Let's see, I'm trying to keep my time. Would be Suleh Hudeviya. In that, we're talking about re redefining pluralism, that is respecting the otherness of others. In Suleh Hudeviya Treaty, uh, after all was done, I'm going to go to the bottom line. The paper was presented or whatever they had instrument where the, there were two signatures were, one for Prophet Muhammad and one for the tribe, the man from the tribe of Quraysh. And when the treaty was presented for signature, the other man, he said, I'm not signing this. It says, my name is fine, but the other name is Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. I don't accept him as prophet. I accept him as Muhammad, but not a prophet. And I can dramatize this. Allah forgive me for that. Hazrat Ali, if you were there in his place, he said, what is this nonsense you were talking about? He is the prophet of God. You cannot talk like this. Shut up. That would have been the, my response or your response. But Prophet Muhammad held them back, both Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Usman. And he said, he doesn't know that I am prophet of God. He knows me as Muhammad bin Abdullah. And you know as Muhammad Rasulullah. Let's learn to respect the otherness of other. Not agreeing with him, but accepting his version of the prophet. And the name was changed and he signed. This is the biggest example in Islam of pluralism. The second example is the Masjid and Nabi example, where he, the Christians from Najran visited him and they were all praying, discussing. By the way, for Muslims, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is the first man on this entire earth who started the interfaith dialogue. There was no one before that. Jesus did not have an opportunity to deal with different religion. Moses did. On Indian side, Krishna, Buddha, none of them had a chance. Prophet Muhammad was the only one who had a chance to interact with Jews, Christians and others. And he started the interfaith dialogue for the purpose of learning and understanding and obviously to give them the message of Islam. When he did that, at, at a time came where the Najran Christians had to pray and they wanted to go outside and pray. Prophet asked them at that time, why don't you pray here? That was in Masjid in Nabwi, his own masjid. Why don't you pray here? This is Allah, this is God's house. But they chose to go outside. I don't know what they did after that. But the point here is, if they had agreed, this is supposition, if they had agreed to pray in the mosque, they would have prayed to, they would have called on Jesus as son of a God. Prophet Muhammad, what would he have done? Would he have applied the same formula that he applied in Hudaybiyah, respecting the otherness of others? That is, he knew that's what Christians believed, Jesus as Son of God. But he didn't believe, and it is not part of our Islamic tradition. But would he have watched them pray, and what he would have done? More than likely, being Rahmatullah al he would have graciously watched their prayers. And then probably would have said, this is how we see. But what the point is, we have to learn to respect the otherness of others. We can give many examples, but with the time limitations, I will cut at that. But the other two key points that Prophet taught that could appeal to the entire universe is humility. Arrogance is one single reason we have conflicts. I am better than you. My view supersedes your view. You don't know anything. If we have that attitude towards Christians, Jews, and Hindus, it's denigrating their otherness of others. 
they believe in it. They, it's not their fault that they believe. It is not my fault that I believe what I believe. So we have to learn to respect that to create the society. And in Quran, again, God loves two people. Uh, God loves most those who forgive and those who are not arrogant. And that is very critical, those who are not arrogant. If I say, I'm talking from a pluralism, it is a bold statement I'm making, my religion, Islam, is superior to other religions. I'm creating conflict right off the bat. And that is arrogance in me, that my religion is superior. God doesn't want me to claim that. God doesn't like arrogant people. God wants to deal things humility. Even if you want to convert somebody, you can convert with humility. If you challenge the other person's faith, then you don't have, you have a conflict, not understanding. So that is one big thing. The second part of the humility that appeals to the whole humanity is in Quran, there are one or two places. It says, treat all Nabis, all prophets the same. I'm so glad Allah said that and Prophet Muhammad delivered that to us. If Quran had said, Nabi Wasallam is the greatest prophet, others are inferior. Imagine how much arrogance we would have been loaded with. We would have had more wars, more problems. Thank God for giving those verses and bringing humility. Humility builds bridges. Arrogance destroys that. And Islam is about respecting the otherness of others. And, uh, and that's what pluralism is. Thank you very much. And uh, I open up to comments from Imam and then you and then we have a conversation. I think it is really important to note, um, and especially the religious people will uh, make a point of this, that uh, pluralism uh, shouldn't necessarily uh, mean that I agree with your opinion or I agree with your belief. Uh, rather, it just means that I may disagree with your belief, but I will respect you for your belief. And that's actually what the Quran says, وَلَا تَسُبُّ الَّذِينَ يَدْعُونَ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ فَيَسُبُّ اللَّهَ عَدْمًا بِغَيْرِ uh, Do not curse those people that call other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not call unto other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Otherwise, if you do that, they're going to turn around and they're going to curse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too. So the respect uh, from that perspective has been highlighted to us in the Quran, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I agree with what you are doing and I agree with your belief. Rather, I disagree with you, but at the same time I can respect you because you're a fellow human being. And that is uh, the line that most of the religious people will draw and not fall into this trap of thinking, well, everybody is equal because everybody has contradictory, contradictory beliefs. If we say, for example, that we believe in only one God, uh, then how can we also agree at the same time that other people that believe in more than one God, they can be correct? If two contradictions cannot be correct at the same time. So that's the point that I think needs to be put across very, very clearly. And I'm glad you mentioned that. That same point in Surah Kafir, the last verse, to you, your faith, to me, my faith. And that is also an expression of pluralism. Even in the examples of Prophet Muhammad, he didn't agree with them. He accepted that there is an otherness to the issue. And pluralism is not a mishmash of religion. It is just each religion is just who they are, I am who I am. How do we live together? Other? Thank you. Yeah, it was very good. Uh, I benefited from a lot of the points you said. In fact, some of the things um, you know, you said actually uh, segue very well into some of the other discussions and things I want to bring up later on. So, um, this uh, ability to actually interact with others, be open to hearing others, um, however, comes from uh, not only an energy or a passion to try to show someone that you're right and someone else that has a wrong idea, but rather a, a real concern for human beings, a real concern for humanity. Um, that fundamental uh, idea is really what's at the basis of why I understand the Prophet, peace be upon him, is doing the things that he's doing. It's, uh, uh, but fundamentally speaking, the Prophet, peace be upon him, is concerned with uh, 
not uh, taking his own position, but trying to uh, not understand, get connected with everyone, and allow others to come in and see what he is doing. So uh, he is not isolating himself. His language is not isol uh, in isolation or doesn't uh, exude isolation, but rather uh, is very universal, trying to embrace everyone else uh, as well. Um, not in terms of their theology or their understanding or faith necessarily, but uh, I like what the Imam just said, in their humanness. So uh, everyone has you know, a concern for their future. Everyone has a concern for uh, human beings, the indigent, the poor. Everyone has a, a concern for their own life and where everyone goes at the end of this life. The Prophet, uh, I understand, peace and blessings of God upon him, is mostly concerned with connecting with this reality with everyone. So, um, seeing all the individuals that he uh, that he interacts with, as also as human beings, as God's creatures, as created beings from God, is also a very important part of this. If you don't see your neighbor, or if you don't see uh, your fellow uh, human being, uh, you know that you interact with or that you meet, as also uh, a God. Uh, created being, yeah. You don't see that relation there in that person. You will, you will definitely mis mistreat them. But seeing them as created by God, also uh, one of God's creatures, gives, uh, gives. I, I understand the prophet's case, gives him mercy, concern, and connection with God. Also, when he interacts with them, that's uh, I understand is fundamental. Seeing the tawhid aspect or the oneness of God aspect in his interactions with the people and with the. Uh, and in, in, in any discussion with you Thank you. No, ma'am. We all have about three to four minutes each. Uh, well, I, and I, Imam Sab is welcome to jump in any time. I was, you know, uh, to me, Quran is the ultimate truth, and I hope my faith keeps on increasing on that. Uh, the two most uh, fascinating verses which I have ever come across on this issue was 20 to 40, Surah Al Hajj, verse number 40. And Surah Anam, uh, verse number 48. These two, especially Surah Anam, is, is great in a way that it is the last surah, last legislative surah, which will be revealed on the Prophet, peace be upon him. And although I don't subscribe to abrogation theory at all, it can counter the abrogation theory, which most people say, no, that that's not for you know three or three eighty six or what? What is that? Three eighty five. The eighty five has superseded everything. So I told the gentleman, you know, the five forty eight came much later. How that could have been superseded by something which came earlier? And that surah, which uh, you know, uh, I have heard you quoting a lot, that you know, if God wanted us to one nation, He could have made it. But this is a test, actually. I was trying to read it. Uh, unfortunately, I can't. Uh, yeah, here it is. Uh, to each of you, we prescribe the minhaj, a law, and a method. Had God willed, he would have made you one nation, united in religion, but he intended to test you in what he has given to you. So to compete with each other in doing the good, and God will decide on the day of judgment our differences. So that and where, you know, uh, the 2240 was another thing which, uh, you know, uh, floored me, where it uh, said that, you know, uh, if God had not prevented one group of tyrants, you know, bad people from hurting others, then all these uh, temples, these synagogues, these churches, these masajids, where God's name is extolled, so, you know, Quran puts all the ways of worship at a level which is unheard of in any other uh, book that I am aware of. So these are my two guiding principles when I listen to somebody arrogantly saying, you know, who is better, who is, that line comes, God will judge. That Thank you. On the day of judgment. Um, I agree with everything that was said, um, especially to take time to know each other and respect the otherness. A lot of people call me a hippie because I'm just like, I don't understand why everyone can't just love each other and get along. Especially when it comes to interfaith dialogue, we emphasize a lot. We try to emphasize the similarities we have between the faiths, which I think is really important, obviously. But there's a complete beauty in the differences that we have. Um, 
and the differences does not, that does not mean we need to have conflict. Um, that's my point, that there is beauty in the differences. If anything, understanding the differences makes you more sure of who you are, I think. Um, and it does encourage dialogue. Understanding why others are different, why they are similar with you. So. Yes. Thank you very much, Mike. I think um, definitely um, I think one concept that I have is that uh, religion is a dynamic thing. So it's not like rules cannot be changed. I'll give you an example. Many people say that if you steal something, you know, in really old law, your hand should be cut. But in the era of Hazrat Umar, when there was increasing unemployment and people were stealing food, he said, no, that cannot be applied in this situation. There is tolerance, there is common sense. And I think that's one thing that uh, people lack. Uh, I just, uh, you know, you and I talked about it. I mean, there are sunnas of profit, like small things, you put your right foot first or left foot first, and they are very difficult to follow. But on a higher degree, there are sunnas of profit, they are very easy to follow, like goodwill nurturing, accepting someone else. These are also sunnas of profit. Actually, if you consider religion as a higher philosophy, you should actually follow these things that are more philosophical. If you look at Islamic history, starting from Hazrat Abu Bakr all the way to Hazrat Umar, Hazrat Usman, Hazrat Ali, all the religions were tolerated very well. And uh, you know when Syria, even you know uh, when you know Zoroastrianism, when we went to Muslims went to Iran at that time, they were also once people have given up, they were also protected. All the religions were protected, just like you have a flower in. Uh, just like you have a lot of small flowers everywhere. In Islamic history also, uh, I think one thing that you should, uh, and we should talk about is Umayyads. You know, Umayyads generally had a policy of tolerance, that it be in Spain or that it be in Damascus. All the religions were respected. In Mughal era, all the religions were respected. If you look at the Norat and or nine jewels of Akbar, Akbar the Great, Tansan, obviously, was not a Muslim. Every religion was respected. And when the intolerance came in, and everyone can chip in, when Aurangzeb went in first time and started imposing the Zimmi tax on non-Muslims, that's where the frustration came in, people. That's where the Mughal Empire crumbled. So I think in an evolution of human thought, I don't think pluralism is the final step but pluralism is a step. And we should all target to evolve, uh, as you said, you know, into a higher society. And uh, I think pluralism would be the next step. And Islam as a religion is very dynamic. If tomorrow someone comes up with something new about Islam, or someone comes up with a new concept, obviously. A religion that claims that it's going to be there for next several centuries has to have that accommodation to accept otherness of others. I think those will be the main things I'd like to mention. <coughs> and also, um, I think it's, it's a religion of love. So Islam has a, Islam and for that matter Christianity. In Islamic books, as you know, Iman and Mujammal, it actually tells us that we should believe in all the prophets. Why should we believe in all the prophets if we are not going to agree with some of the things that they are doing? We definitely accept their otherness of others. That's part of being a Muslim. We believe in all the books. And this thing was something that was uh, actually accepted like that. A small point I'd like to make in, in current scenarios is that sometimes we try to jump on conclusions. For example, and correct me, there is a whole people and I may not be that much. Like, for example, what happened in Peshawar, Pakistan. The people who conducted the attack are saying it's a revenge attack. They are not saying they conducted it in the name of religion, correct? Mm -hmm. It is a revenge attack. The person who conducts the attack says, I did a revenge attack. He did not say, I'm a Muslim and I killed you because you are not a Muslim. Why should we go on defensive on something like that? and just say that this was, no, it was a revenge attack, just like there have been many revenge attacks in the history of mankind. So it was a pure, as you said, animal instinct. 
a revenge attack, and I think it should be kept aside from all the discussion. Islam, and for that matter, Christianity, Islam is beautiful ayahs about Christianity and Quran. You know, and they are very, very true. Islam talks about Jews, different religions, and how they accept each other. So I think one last distinction I'd like to make is uh, comparing Muslims with Mongols. Right? Mongols actually conquered more area than Muslims did. But they are back to Mongolia. Right? The essence of, as you know, Iqbal, one of the Eastern philosophers says, love is timeless. The religions that have love in them, they are the ones that have survived the test of time. The religions that don't have that essence of love, they have not survived the essence of time. So basically, Islam and Christianity and Judaism have survived the essence of time. The jury is out. So now is the next step on human evolution. We need to accept each other just the way we are. And then we need to complement each other and then take it from there. Muslim. Well, that was the Muslim starts. I think the issue of the Peshawar attack, uh, we need to also take into consideration the uh, cultural phenomenon of yeah. the Patan concept of revenge, Badla, which is ingrained in their system from yeah. centuries, uh, even millennia, you can say. So that has to have played into this whole issue. Yeah, and they are not saying we did it, but they are saying we did a revenge attack. <coughs> person who performed it said, I did a revenge attack, so it was a revenge attack. Asalaamu uh, Alaikum. Uh, as just pluralism is concerned, I don't know why, but I would just uh, share it with you. Uh, I have some kind of a reservation with the term. Uh, being it amongst a myriad of isms, as if we are trying to put it in a cubby hole or in a certain uh, corner. And while uh, humanly we do all those things uh, which are under the realms of uh, uh, pluralism, as conceptually actually I agree, as a matter of fact it was a Democratic Party convention. Uh, El Paso, uh, quite a few years back, I was given a couple of minutes to speak in that state convention, and I said, Islam is the best religion in the world. There was a lull, there was a silence, <coughs> just like Christianity is the best religion for Christians. But if it is not so, they better look for another religion. I am a Muslim because I am convinced that this is the religion for me, but it doesn't mean that uh, I would not accommodate others on human terms. Uh, so when it comes to equalness of religion, I will not call it as uh, uh, Imam Sahab has already mentioned it so eloquently. That's how I felt it after that clarification. I think uh, we are all doing in a sense, what the call is, but not doing maybe enough. America is a very good example at the work level, where you work, at the community level, we all are accommodating otherness of others. Without that, we just cannot exist. That's the beauty of uh, 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 the country that we live in. Humans are, problem is humans are it's not a problem, but it's a fact. Humans are not uh, created on a production line. They are not cookie-cutter uh, productions. Everyone, as you rightly mentioned, is unique. And uh, the ayah uh, uh, that uh, Dr. Saab mentioned, that uh, compels me to say that, OK, fine, everybody has been given a different path. Uh, maybe he'll be just from that path. But at the same time, at the right time, at the appropriate time, and I found it very comfortable with the most religious people to communicate and discuss about the existence of God. That's very, un, uh, I mean, uh, very uh, strange sometimes. But I find that those who are religious, it is very easy to talk to them on religion 
uh, or sharing our religion, if that could communicate them or uh, I'm able to tell them about uh, the right path, which I think is the right path, and if there is the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, maybe uh, the person will get the, uh, get the guidance, whatever it may be. But maybe he already from Allah's doctrine or Allah's uh, divine decision, he already may be on the right path. Who am I say, to say that he is not? After saying all these things, my feeling is that uh, uh, all the good things are around. But still, this is the time to define ourselves. Thank you. Where we are. Uh, so that that's what my uh, uh, basic reading is that uh, we have to define ourselves, feel confident, and then reach out. I'll just address two things that you brought up. One was ism, pluralism. Pluralism is not a mandated, regulated system. It is just an attitude. An attitude. Nothing but an attitude of respecting the otherness of other. And you mentioned about accommodating the others. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the Medina Treaty, he had accommodated all faiths into the system where the Jews would be judged. Their decisions were made based on Jewish law, Christians based on Christian law. That is one beautiful way of accommodating things. Ambona? Well, um, I believe in pluralism, obviously, and the, the reason why I... You I'm should look at this way. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was, my uh, headlight was going on here when I was so, uh, And the reason why we are all here is obviously we, we have the patience to listen to each other and talk to each other and discuss issues that are important. As a journalist, I deal with all kind of people and interview all kind of people. And um, in my investigative journalism, I've even come across people who have posed as somebody else, but in the end they have turned out to be actual Taliban or their apologists or their sympathizers and to them I'm not a good enough of a Muslim because I question them because I question what they are doing in the name of religion. Um, my question since uh, Imam Saab is here also and we're all here, how, how do we deal with the killing of the minorities in the name of Islam back home? How do we address the killing of Shias and Ahmadis and people who take the liberty of you know, as far as calling them that they are not Muslims, even though somebody is saying, I'm a Muslim, I think the dialogue stops there. If somebody is saying, I'm a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Christian, you have no right to ask why. You should just accept it and talk about something else. It's a lack of Quranic you knowledge. Just, yeah, exactly. You just can't ask why and then attack them and, you know, pass on fatwas uh, that, you know, since they don't practice the way we do, hence they deserve to die. And since you are calling them, Ahmadi Muslims or Shia Muslims, so you are sympathizing with them, hence you are friends with the Kafir, hence you should die also, and when you will come back to Pakistan, we'll teach you a lesson, and yada yada. So how can we address that um, from a pluralistic point of view, or even, you know, Islamic point of view, and Islamic point of view, so I would like Very both of you point. to Very address that. I will go to one education, long-term education. One of the things, we had a very successful experiment in Yemen, mm -hmm. in the country of Yemen, where the Al-Qaeda guys were all rounded up. The judge in the Yemen, he offered, I'm going to say in a few words, he told the guys in the prison, hey, look, I'm going to give you a copy of the Quran. Find in the Quran where Allah allows you to go kill anybody randomly, killing innocent. If you find it, that Allah does that, then we will deal with it. But if you don't find it, let me know. And then I will have some rewards for you, whatever you find. And for he gave them three months, they read Quran from back to forth, back to forth. Could not find any verse. They were misguided by the Taliban that this is what Quran says. <clears throat> and by doing that, the judge released a whole lot of terrorists from the cell and they walked out of the cell believing we have been duped about Quran and Islam. Quran is a beautiful faith. It is not what those guys told us. Now that we have read it ourselves, it is not that. So that is one formula that we can look. And uh, the second part, which I'll uh, let your mom deal with that. Second part is the court, the, uh, the Taliban guy first, he said, Prophet Muhammad did it, so we are going to do it. 
and uh, there are some hadiths that are misquoted in, uh, in uh, I, I consulted with the Imam there is one verse and uh, one hadith where it says prophet ordered uh, kind of terrorizing uh, the guy for not telling the truth and uh, that I had difficulty in absorbing that so there are a lot of hadiths that they had to be verified and that these guys are quoting legitimately quoting sometimes I feel like it is not their problem the problem is ours because we let those books in their hands and they're believing what they're seeing if I go tell them that that is a wrong hadith they will not believe me because for generations they have believed in that so we as a Muslims have a bigger responsibility to find a way to go undo the book with their involvement we cannot tell them they're wrong they, they will not believe you but we need to be involved with them have them study Quran and uh, go through that and when they see it themselves that they have been doped that's when the correction comes it's a long term let's just yeah uh, basically it goes back to the issue of lack of knowledge or misinformation uh, there's a hadith in which uh, the Prophet ﷺ said about the end times that Allah SWT is not going to just snatch away knowledge it's not going to just disappear off the face of the earth but slowly true scholars are going to fade away, die away and then they're going to be replaced by ignorant people okay? the hadith says they're going to be questioned and they're going to be uh, giving fatwas without knowledge they're going to be astray themselves and they're going to lead other people astray so obviously these people, they got fatwas from somewhere, right? These people, they get fatwas to kill Ahmadis or they get fatwas to kill Shias. They get it from somewhere. Where are they getting it? From people who claim to be scholars, but in reality they have no knowledge. And then going back to the issue of the quoting of Hadith, uh, I find that the majority of people that criticize Islam because of the Hadith, they pull out the Hadith from basically very ambiguous sources. Uh, they may uh, bring them from example, for example, Sira books. And Sira books, uh, traditionally, if you look, ask a scholar, he will tell you that the verification of the hadith in the Sira books is not done as exhaustively as in the actual books of a hadith, the collections of a hadith. So you actually sent me, if you remember the hadith, yes. and you asked me, where is it? About the torture. Yeah, I looked it up, and it was found in a Sira book but it's uh, regarded as invalid by scholars of hadith. So that's where, you know, if you ask a scholar and you actually try to verify something, you'll find that the reality of it is far different from what is quoted. The real problem there, Imam Sahib, is for a common man, you and I know that there is, we have to verify. For a common Muslim, the Taliban or anybody who reads that Sira, they regard almost they equate it with Quran, which is not. They should. Supersede it. So that's, and that is the problem. And how do we solve this problem? How do we tell that this Sirah by Ibn Hisham has got flaws, it is not verified? Can we ask the printers to publish on that? This is bogus, or you have to verify yourself. There is a lot of untruths in it. What do we need to do? Because if a Christian, I saw the right wing Christians quoting those hadiths. And it is there. If I tell them that it is wrong, they will not believe me. They will say, is the book Islamic scholarship for centuries? Who are you to tell this is wrong? So how do we address this? Uh, I think, uh, again, uh, going back to basics, uh, bringing up scholars from our own midst, uh, one of the principal rules of the Quran is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets from amongst their own people to guide them. Um, and unless and until the, the society in which these ills are prevalent, they don't stand up and educate themselves and educate the people around them, then we, we're going to see, unfortunately, the status quo. May I have one suggestion just on this? The sister, I mean, Dr. Mona asked, how do we you know, change all this? We can have, I have counted about 10 verses. Like we just discussed 22, 45, 48, 262, 569, and several others. Like uh, in the Christian Bible, you know, many times they have John 3.16 written in various <coughs> languages. I don't know whether it's Islamically acceptable. I don't see a problem there that these verses, at least those Qurans which are published in the West, although the, the need is in the East, 
but there also these verses can be translated in Urdu or lo local language and placed at the end of every Quran. You know, then we, nobody has time to find, I didn't find these verses till I was about 33. So, yeah. I'd like to hear Adam's okay. input on my question. Okay, sure. Also. Thank you. Yeah, I think there's a, there a challenge in the way that Islam and Islamic thought has been constructed um, where a lot of people use uh, the primary way of understanding and uh, justifying their religion is through the scripture itself. That's, uh, that's, you find that in the Christian world, you find that in the Muslim world, in every case. One of the things we don't uh, pay attention to, though, is the Quran itself is asking us to look at the universe, to confirm its truth within the conditions around us. Um, that's one aspect of it. The other aspect uh, of what, why this, where the issues come from is our living within these kind of sub-communities, these kind of isolated groups, where um, they have some potentially political uh, ideologies mixed in with their cultural views of religion. Uh, they are substantiating their own views based upon, again, their own culture. It's very isolated. They don't live within a much larger view of the world. They don't see the world. They try to refrain from seeing the rest of the world. So I don't know about that, but I can't comment anything much about uh, Taliban. I don't know. I didn't study much about them. But my understanding is their interpretations justify their own political ambitions or their own political needs. Again, this is common across all the areas. And in particular, uh, with how they look at religion and how they look at their lives and their community, they isolate them from the rest of the world. They try to encourage they become isolated more and more with the religious ideas and from the broader world that's going on around them. That continues to harbor more of these feelings, especially when they look at, uh, at what's going on on the internet or they look at what's going on in the news. They say, oh, the world is like this, but we're being taught this. They must be bad over there. And then they just start reacting. So I, I think it's an issue of how we've constructed our religious understanding. Uh, we cannot only use scripture um, um, scripture uh, as the place of confirmation. For example, we hear this all the time. Where did you get this idea from? Oh, Quran says it. Everyone says that. Everybody's, uh, any religious person says that about their religion. That's insufficient. We have to come beyond that and say, what made sense in the Quran uh, that, uh, to me that says that that's the right idea? Because everybody cites their own sources and these sorts of scriptures. I put that. I would like to make a comment on that. Well, basically, I was touching upon what Adam was mentioning, the issue of uh, just quoting uh, a text of willy-nilly. It's not just an issue of the quote, rather the context in which the quote was set. And that's the important of this. Uh, and that only comes with knowledge. We go back to that issue again, about knowledge. Uh, if your context is your own political ambitions, yeah. then you're going to sure. do that. Mm -hmm. If your context is the prophet, peace be upon him, speaks to all of humanity, so then you can't kill this other person, you cannot think negatively of this other person, prophet, prophet, that contradicts prop messengership, the notion of what my real messengership. But that context doesn't exist in most sub-community political, you know, these isolated groups. Thank you. Awesome. Uh, uh, as uh, Brother Suleiman has mentioned that uh, Peshawar attack was a revenge attack. So that's what we should say. And I think Imam also sort of concurred with it. Uh, but, uh, and uh, there are letters coming left and right to us also in emails that Zerbe as had it not been there, then there wouldn't have been any Peshawar also. My personal feeling is that uh, when it comes to what Taliban, where the source of them was from religious grounds, Mujahideen, they became Taliban, they are the, the ones currently all over the world uh, designated as some people who are the torch bearers of Islam today, that's the stamp on them. When they go and kill and say that, okay, these are the Muslims, revenge or no revenge, they are the ones who killed. We are all on defensive and we don't have a way out. That's what I feel about it. And it's unfortunate because my comment to them was that, what about before Zerbeas? Mm -hmm. Why did it start? 
And before that, before thousands were killed, and they were all bonded to Jerna. They went and killed themselves. Where did that theory come from? That was also all the Quran and all those uh, uh, Bahisht and yeah. that promise was there. And that's uh, what they were trained in, basically, and that's what they have been branded or not. They, they right now are representing ISIS or not or whatever. Currently, unfortunately, they are the ones who represent Islam, unfortunately. Gosh. And we, the majority, the silent majority, are beating the lines. I mean, we are just talking. We have not come forth as forcefully. Those guys who are putting their lives on, and what have we done? Talk, lip service. Well, we've got about three minutes. Let me conclude this segment. And the good news, I want to share something about Quran. I have given many presentations, including the Parliament of Religions, along with Tariq Ramadan. The Hilal Khan translation has been a major source of conflict. And Surah Fatiha, seventh verse, it, he translates, although it is in parentheses, hey, God help me walk the right path, not the path of those who went astray. That's what Arabic says. But he added in the parentheses like Jews are Christians. That has become a very painful thing. And I'm not claiming any credit, but I have worked on it. Several people have worked on it. That translation has been stopped for the last two years. That's coming from Medina. Printed. I talked to the Saudi Imams, many that come to Dallas. Now that translation is stopped. There are 60 such verses. I haven't had a chance to look all the 60, but I do know that the very first chapter that everybody reads has been corrected, the new translation. But there are about 2 million copies out, given out freely in people's hands. If I'm a Jew or a Christian, if I read that, I'm offended. Why would now all of a sudden become one God, become Muslims, God teaches them to hate me. So there is a room for us. We have been working. All of us can work together. Even with the Hadiths, there is a movement in Turkey. And you said uh, in Egypt, in Turkey, in Turkey and Egypt, where they're working on going through reviewing the Hadith to see if each Hadith fits the character of Prophet Muhammad, who is peace be upon him, uh, who is mercy to mankind. If they don't fit, they're working out and uh, taking them out. Hopefully, we'll speed that work up. And here in the US, there is a Dr. Shabir Ahmad. He has listed uh, some hundred some Hadiths uh, from Sahih Bukhari that are not Sahih. So we need to continue to work and discuss and bring about a change. And Mona, I, feel, I hope I'm very really pained about what's happening in Pakistan with the Ahmadi, Shia, and other Muslims. I hope the TV shows uh, come out with programs to build cohesive Pakistan as opposed to that. That would be the first step to do. With that, we conclude this program. And uh, the last word from the Imam, and we'll conclude the program. Thank you. I think uh, everything's been said and discussed in detail, and uh, I think uh, there's really nothing more to add. Thanks. We hope you carry the discussion on your own from this, and let us know what you do. Thank you very much.